Hello everyone. I sure did miss you. My name is Jason Kishnev. If you're watching A People's Historian and we are reading A State of War. Secret History of the CIA and the Bush Administration. And this is the show, remember, where we read 30 minutes of history together. I forgot that part. Um, if you're wondering what's happened to the reduced uh, episode schedule it's summer and it's uh, I'm just a normal person like you and I've got kids and it's just it's challenging to make videos during the summer so we've got a reduced schedule and they're coming out slower but they're still coming out so keep tuning in because history is important we don't know shit about how we got to this place we're at now without paying attention to history. We don't know what's coming down the line. We can't see what's coming unless we read history and then we can recognize some of the behaviors and we can we can say, oh, I heard him say something like that before. So it's important. And for that reason, YouTube may unsubscribe you. So remember to hit that notification bell when you hit the like and subscribe button. Because if they unsubscribe you, you'll still get notifications when I make new videos. Which are coming out at a slower pace. I'm sorry. I missed you. I really did. But we're, keep make, we're, we're, we're continuing to make videos. We're going to keep making videos. And... Uh, Let's dig in. We were, I think we're in chapter 8 here. Yeah, chapter 8. I guess it hasn't been that long. Well, actually it has. We're in chapter 8. We'll finish this up tonight. Um, to be sure, the operation was high risk. And there was a strong possibility that it would be so messy that Bin Laden would be killed rather than captured. Tenet and the CIA's lawyers worried deeply about that issue. They believed that the covert action finding on Al-Qaeda that President Clinton had signed authorized only Bin Laden's capture, not his death. After 9-11, senior Clinton administration officials disputed Tenet's claim that he had never been given the authorization to kill Bin Laden. Another problem was that the CIA was attempting a military-style operation, and before 9-11, the CIA lacked much par paramilitary capability. <clears throat> At the time, the U.S. military had no interest in getting drawn into Afghanistan in order to hunt for bin Laden, and so resisted White House efforts to get them to come up with plans of their own to target al-Qaeda. With the Pentagon out of the picture, the job was left to the agency. <clears throat> the CIA asked the U.S. Joint Special Operations Command to review its plan, conducted several field rehearsals, and had the plan vetted by the White House. While there was certainly no guarantee of success, the plan represented the U.S. government's best chance to grab Osama bin Laden before he might become a bigger threat. Just as the final preparations, and this is before 9-11, it doesn't give a date. I see a date coming, but I'm not sure if we're at that date now. So let's just say it's before 9-11. Could have killed bin Laden. Could have grabbed him before he became... A bigger threat. Just as the final preparations for the operation were in the works in May 1998, so that is when we're talking, three years before, obviously, 9-11, a delegation of top CIA officials, including Tenet, traveled to Saudi Arabia for meetings with Saudi Crown Prince Abdullah. According to a CIA source who was involved in the matter, Tenet asked the Crown Prince if the Saudis could help Washington deal with the problem of Osama bin Laden. 
The Crown Prince said yes, but only if the Americans kept this arrangement quiet. The CIA source said that the Saudi added that Washington should not ask that bin Laden be taken to the United States for trial. He could be dealt with by the Saudis. The Saudis proposed, in effect, to pay the Taliban for bin Laden. That's what happens when you're that filthy rich. You think you could just buy anything and anyone. Pay the Taliban for bin Laden. Tenet sent a classified memorandum from Saudi Arabia back to Washington addressed to National Security Advisor Sandy Berger, recommending that the CIA allow the Saudis to try to get bin Laden, according to a CIA source who later had access to the memo. Just as Tenet was maneuvering with the Saudis, he canceled the CIA's own covert capture plan, convincing the White House that the agency should stand down. Good job, George! Within the CIA, one of the explanations given to senior officers involved in the operation was that the risk of killing bin Laden was too great. Yeah. And that the agency might then be accused of conducting an assassination. Well, you don't want to be accused of assassinating somebody. The Saudis never seem to have made any serious attempt to get Bin Laden. After Tenet's meeting with Crown Prince Abdullah, Prince Turki was sent to Afghanistan for a series of talks with the Taliban, but he wasn't able to reach an agreement with the Afghans about Bin Laden. By then, the CIA's capture plan was dead, and the CIA had no other serious alternatives in the works. The agency's leaders had abandoned one of the only realistic opportunities the CIA ever had to capture bin Laden before 9-11. It is possible that the Crown Prince's offer of assistance simply provided Tenet and other top CIA officials an easy way out of a covert action plan that they had come to believe represented far too big of a gamble. Of course, no one could have expected that the unintended consequences of the CIA's decision to trust the Saudis to go after bin Laden would become so apparent so quickly. In August 1998, less than three months after Tenet's visit to Saudi Arabia, suicide bombers blew up two U.S. embassies in East Africa marking the start of a new and far more deadly phase in Al-Qaeda's war against the United States. At about 4.30 in the morning on the frantic day after the East Africa bombings, George Tenet walked into the office of Michael Schuer, then the chief of the Bin Laden unit, and closed the door, according to Schuer. Tenet seemed shaken. The decision to cancel the capture operation had quickly come back to haunt the agency. He looked at Schuer and said, I guess we made a mistake, Schuer recalled later. Schuer, furious and blaming Tenet for the decision to kill the operation, responded, No, sir, I think you made a mistake. Oh. That, <laughs> that December, Tenet wrote a memo declaring that the U.S. intelligence community was at war with Al-Qaeda. Wow. The CIA chief declared war on Al-Qaeda without the president and without Congress. That is really interesting. That's not something I've ever heard before. I've never heard of a CIA director doing that. Almost no one saw the memo, and of those who did, almost no one who really knew how the issue had been handled believed it. The Saudis could
continued to drag their feet on investigating Al-Qaeda right up to the September 11th attacks, even as the CIA began to sense that a major attack was looming and was frantically asking the Saudis for assistance. Throughout the spring and summer of 2001, the CIA received a series of increasingly ominous reports that Al-Qaeda was planning a major terrorist attack. The problem was that the CIA did not know when or where the attacks were likely to take place. The best guess at the time was that Al-Qaeda was planning a strike somewhere overseas. All of its previous attacks against U.S. interests had been in the Middle East or Africa. As part of its efforts that summer to uncover Al-Qaeda's plans, the CIA sought help from a number of foreign intelligence services, particularly in the Middle East, including that of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has several security agencies, but the General Intelligence Directorate, or GID, is its main intelligence arm. I know it sounds like you just graduated high school, but it's not. Throughout that pre-9-11 period, CIA headquarters sent the CIA station in Riyadh urgent NIACS night action cables seeking immediate middle-of-the-night assistance from the Saudis on counterterrorism cases no one at headquarters wanted to be the officer who allowed a case to wait until morning, only to find that an attack had taken place the night before. Unfortunately, it sounds really jumpy at CIA, head CIA headquarters, doesn't it? It does not sound like a relaxing work environment. Maybe they need to get OSHA in there. Sorry, terrible joke. Unfortunately, the CIA had little independent intelligence inside, inside Saudi Arabia. It relied almost entirely on its liaison relationship with Saudi intelligence for information on Islamic extremists in the Saudi Kingdom. But the Saudis were not being forthcoming despite the heightened alert conditions and the CIA was not happy about it small team of CIA officials went to Saudi Arabia that summer to complain about the lack of cooperation. <laughs> Try to imagine that conversation. The delegation traveled to Jeddah, which Saudi officials preferred during the summer to the heat of the capital of Riyadh. The CIA officers pointedly reminded the Saudis that the CIA had begun to share much more intelligence with Saudi security, including highly classified communications intercepts of suspected terrorists, which the NSA had been reluctant to agree to hand over to the Saudis for fear that the information would be revealed to Al-Qaeda. And yet this new openness on the American side had not led to a similar increase in cooperation from the Saudi side. A number of current and former CIA officials say they believed that the Saudis simply couldn't bring themselves to go after Al-Qaeda before 9-11. The Saudi government seemed convinced that it was better to appease Islamic extremists than provoke them. In addition, there were strong suspicions among some CIA officials that at least some of the intelligence they shared with Saudi security officials was passed on to Al-Qaeda operatives. The story of Abu Zubaydah's capture and his links to Saudi Arabia did not end with his pocket litter. Remember, that's the stuff in his pocket that, you know, was probably relevant clues. After he was seized in Pakistan, Abu Zubaydah was flown to Thailand and was placed in a secret CIA detention facility. At some point after his capture, U.S. sources say that the CIA created an atmosphere that allowed them to convince Abu Zubaydah that he was in Saudi Arabia in the custody of Saudi intelligence. 
the CIA believed that he would be so frightened by the prospect of being tortured at the hands of the Saudis that he would begin to talk. Instead, the American officers were surprised that Abu Zubaydah was actually pleased and relieved to be in Saudi custody. As General Posner had written, Abu Zubaydah then gave his captors several phone numbers of Saudi contacts who could vouch for him and who could help him out of his predicament. In addition to the incidents described by Posner, a senior former American government official said that the United States had obtained other evidence that suggests connections between Al-Qaeda operatives and telephone numbers associated with Saudi officials. There is no... <sighs> Excuse me. There is no conclusive evidence that members of the Saudi royal family or other senior Saudi officials had direct connections to Abu Zubaydah. No conclusive evidence. But the fact that the terrorist leader gave his interrogators those numbers raises intriguing questions. Some officials believed that Abu Zubaydah's recitation of the Saudi telephone numbers may have been part of a well-rehearsed disinformation campaign to be employed in the event of capture and designed to sow discord between America and its allies. After all, Osama bin Laden hated the Saudi royal family and believed that they were corrupt autocrats who had defiled Islam's holy places by inviting American troops onto Saudi soil following the first Gulf War. There is no evidence that a thorough examination of his claims of ties to powerful Saudis was ever conducted. Yeah, of course not. We didn't want to know. Both before, excuse me, both before and after 9/11, the CIA continued to rely almost entirely on the Saudi security services for information about Islamic extremists operating inside Saudi Arabia and had almost no spies of its own inside Saudi Arabia who could report on the Saudi relationship with Al-Qaeda. Some sources say that George Tenet set the tone for the CIA's Saudi relationship by relying heavily on developing close relationships with top Saudi officials including Prince Bandar bin Sultan bin Abdulaziz, then the Saudi ambassador to the United States, also known affectionately by George Herbert Walker Bush as Bandar Bush. Little known fact. Fun fact. Tenet met regularly with the Saudi ambassador. CIA officers familiar with the agency's relationship with Saudi Arabia say that about once a month, Tenet would slip away from CIA headquarters and travel to Bandar's nearby estate in McLean, Virginia for quiet talks. In a 2003 profile of Bandar in The New Yorker, why would The New Yorker be doing a profile on Bandar? In a 2003 profile of Bandar in The New Yorker, Elsa Walsh wrote that, the, that Tenet showed up at Bandar's home while she was interviewing the Saudi. Bandar and Tenet had a very close relationship, said one CIA officer. Bandar had a unique role. He was in charge of the American relationship for Saudi Arabia. But some CIA officers handling Saudi issues complained that Tenet would not tell them what he had discussed with Bandar, making it difficult for agency officials to know the nature of any deals their boss was arranging with the Saudis. They would usually find out what Tenet had said to Bandar only much later, and then only from the Saudis. T. 
Can it consider the Saudi relationship so sensitive that in the late 1990s he named one of his closest aides to be Riyadh's station chief? While the former aide was station chief in Saudi Arabia, he would sometimes communicate directly with Tenet, skirting others in the chain of command within the Near East Division, according to CIA sources. That drove the barons of the NE and CTC counterterrorism center crazy because they were not in the loop, recalled one CIA source. Separately, a veteran CIA analyst said that top agency officials sought to prevent analysis, excuse me, prevent analysts from writing intelligence reports that raised questions about the vulnerabilities faced by the Saudi regime from Islamic extremism, and that as a result the CIA never adequately addressed the most pressing issues concerning the future of the Saudi Kingdom. Top CIA managers were intent on making sure that the CIA did not produce politically inconvenient intelligence that could cause headaches at the White House the longtime Middle East analysts believed. Of course, the Saudis had much more powerful allies in official Washington than George Tenet and the CIA. Prince Bandar, for example, was extremely close to the first President Bush and the entire Bush family, as I said. I guess I gave that part away. I didn't know he was going to mention it. In his book about the war in Iraq, Plan of Attack, Bob Woodward reported that President Bush alerted Bandar to the timing of the 2003 invasion before he notified Secretary of State Colin Powell. Wow. Bandar's close ties to the White House, the State Department, and the CIA helped the Saudi elite avoid serious scrutiny of potential links to Islamic extremists. When a joint House-Senate inquiry into the September 11th attacks uncovered evidence that Bandar's wife had provided tens of thousands of dollars that ended up in the hands of the family of a Saudi man in San Diego who had aided two of the September 11th hijackers, most of official Washington rallied around Bandar and his wife and accepted without further inquiry the official Saudi explanation that it was simply charity. Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's why learning these this history books is so important, right? You'd never know that. I'd never know that. And I'm thrilled to be reading it to you. We're learning it together. Washington's failure to confront questions about Saudi Arabia before and after 9-11 raises much broader questions, including whether the Bush administration really understands or knows how to deal with the rapid political change now underway throughout the Middle East. There is no doubt that something new and bracing is underway in the region. Unprecedented elections in 2005 in Iraq and in the Palestinian territories were followed by mass demonstrations in Beirut against Syrian control over Lebanon's government, which ultimately forced the withdrawal of the Syrian military from the country. Saudi Arabia even held municipal elections, a small step toward political reform in the monarchy. Very small step. The sudden burst of democracy throughout the Middle East, where corrupt dictatorships and monarchies have dominated the political landscape for generations, arrived like a badly needed breath of fresh air. And then the U.S. military helped put them down. No, I'm just kidding. But we are supporting, you know, dictatorships and. Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Egypt, United Arab Emirates, just saying. 
for the Bush administration in search of a new justification for the war in Iraq after the failure to find Iraq's weapons of mass destruction or any evidence of a terrorist alliance between Iraq and Al-Qaeda. The climate of political reform early in 2005 brought a new sense of vindication for the decision to topple Saddam Hussein. President Bush does deserve credit for making the spread of democracy in the Middle East a centerpiece of his agenda for his second term. His second inaugural speech in January 2005 in which he laid out a sweeping vision of a global democratic future resonated with Arab professionals and the growing middle class particularly among the generation of young Arabs who have been deeply frustrated by the political and economic limits they confront. Does this author just give George W. Bush credit for just saying, mentioning something in a speech? I, I'm not sure I understand that part. But you know what, when he's talking about global democracy. It reminds me of George Herbert Walker Bush speaking about um, the New World Order. Right? Scary stuff. Yeah. I mean, not that democracy is bad. Democracy is good. I like democracy. I'm for democracy. It's not what I meant. <laughs> the young dissidents have been aided by New information technologies, from cell phones, to text messaging, to the internet, to satellite television news, which has made it virtually impossible for autocratic regimes to staunch political debate and dissent. The same internet cafes in Arab cities that allow Islamic terrorists to communicate undeterred also give new freedom to dissidents. But the Bush administration's biggest problems have come when it has ignored the realities of the Middle East, has accepted tainted and overly optimistic intelligence, and has suppressed contrary views within its own government. These problems have compounded the CIA's own failures. In the case of one operation in particular, an operation run during the last year of the Clinton administration and later endorsed by the Bush administration, the consequences are frightening. Against Iran, CIA decision makers overrode objections and played an extraordinarily dangerous game. It is a game that Bush administration officials say they may want to play again, despite the risks. And I, that's the end of the chapter, and I'm kind of pissed off at this author for saying that they played a dangerous game with Iran, but not mentioning what the heck he was talking about. That seems kind of lame, doesn't it? Well, stay tuned for the next chapter and maybe we'll hear about it. Glad you joined me. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for tuning into the show. Thanks for hitting that like and subscribe button. Because you know what? The likes and the subscribes click in with the algorithms of YouTube and help this show get recommended to other people so that helps build our success. We gotta build, be successful together. This could be your show too. The more likes we get. I'm happy to share it with you. See you next time.